Ask Alex. Ask Alex. Because you don't know what you don't know. And if you don't know, now you know. Yeah. Mm. Um, so cool. Tell me, um, can you share what you're working on and what, you, what you're stuck with right now? Yeah, so uh, our company is basically a tech platform that helps brands in the UK find and work with manufacturers internationally, obviously. So we're basically looking at helping with uh, people getting manufacturing ready. So design development, linking, communicating with international factories. Cool. So um, were you working in this space before? No, so my background is as an engineer, uh, working in kind of large scale project management. Um, so to kind of translating a lot of the, the kind of processes and ways of managing complex projects onto um, now sort of fashion, homeware and retail um, brands. Okay, so you, so you principally focus on fashion brands then? Or? Yeah, fashion, homeware and furniture. Okay, so like home living and, and, and lifestyle, okay. So exactly. not like heavy engineering, but more like um, gar- the the I guess the garment industry. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's correct. And you said you're mainly focused in India, then I guess that makes sense. Yes. Yeah. Right. Okay. And so you're stuck. Your I guess you're fundraising right now. So we yeah we, t- we already did one round last year, and then we're now getting to kind of second second round. Um, yeah. And I was just yeah, just kind of as my question says, to just go yeah. to get your thoughts on exactly how to what to show in terms of the next three years. You know, when, when should we be thinking about showing when we're cash flow positive, you know, or should we be saying right? Well, actually, we're going to be running. Um, yeah, we're still going to be burning. 20, 20k a month for the next yeah. two years and we need to be raising 10 million in two years or you know what's the kind of what's going to look like the the, the best uh, option or how do we how do we kind of decide what to show i guess um okay the way do you plan on building a, a vc funded business uh it's highly likely i'd say yes so you're basically going to be living on VC money or dependent on it. Yeah. For until exit or? I, I guess, I mean, I guess it's, it's, it's kind of, how would you decide that? Well, I mean, you know, there's, there's public companies which are still losing money, right? Yeah. So, I mean, yeah. I think that we're in a position where, you know, we're already starting to generate good revenue and in terms of the lifetime value of a client over the acquisition costs for us and our running costs. Yeah. I, you know, I, the way that I see it is that we, we could go, we could go cash flow positive from this next raise. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, I think it then becomes just a matter of us balancing out ambitions for growth and pace of growth with, with that. Okay, so, I mean, profitability for some is an option, but it comes at a trade-off to growth, right? And that's funny mm-hmm. why most high-growth companies are vastly not profitable because they just, they keep on turning on their marketing engines or putting, you know, more fuel into them mm-hmm. um, because they think that their cohorts for the LTV calculations work. Um, so the profitability in the short term is put on the back pedal to long-term growth or in but you know the fact that their aggregate revenue in future will be larger and that's that works so long as their churn isn't high fundamentally right uh, or their acquisition costs are not too high so i mean the first question is you just need to decide like what kind of business are you do you really have the potential to grow very fast every single year fundamentally because if you do and your cohorts work out um, then you know it makes sense to acquire more customers because the aggregate size of revenue is, is large and you'll probably get funded for it. Um, mm-hmm. Profitability is a very nice thing because it personally gives you options. So, you know, like welcome to life, everything messes up at some point and so you miss your targets or something and, you know, if you have the option to go profitable, you can kind of fix it. Whereas if you're not profitable, you'll be caught dead. Um, and so if you're not getting much love with investors, the fact that you can be profitable and say, fuck you, I'm not going to raise money, mm. gives you options. And it's quite empowering that way. And I definitely, uh, yes, I mean, just for me personally, I definitely prefer to be in that situation. 
Um, I think, you know, you at least leave all of your options open, right, that, that way. Uh, yeah, it gives you a lot of options, so it's a good thing to have. Okay, but if you're just thinking about this whole fundraising stuff, uh, the best way to kind of approach it is to go back, is to go into the future and then come back to the present. And so what one question almost every finder hasn't thought of is how much they want to sell this thing for. And so the, if you're not really sure, it's best to think in terms of order of magnitude in the right direction. So are we talking a million? 10 million, 100 million, or a billion, okay? So you can call it whatever, a billion bucks. And then what would the multiple be for your business? If it's whatever, 10x, then you need to be making 100 million in whatever kind of revenue that you're making in order to get a billion dollar exit, right? Mm -hmm. So how much does it typically cost to get to build a billion dollar business in your industry? So like enterprise SaaS is historically about 75 million, right? And you can kind of think about that and be like, how many rounds would it take for me to raise 75 million? Maybe it's four, maybe it's five. So it could be seed, series A, series B, series C, series D. And you'd be like, okay, if I raise like a 20 million series D or whatever the math works, how much would 100 million take me to get to 100 million revenue? And so maybe you would be at 60 or 70 million revenue, and then 20 would help you grow and add that other 30 million revenue, right? Mm -hmm. Work back and be like, at series C, I would raise 10 million, and that would get me to my 70 million, so I'd probably be on 50 then. And then my series B, I would want to go from 25 to 50, and I would need 7 million to do that. And then you can work back to now and be like, okay, if this is my life goal, you know, my life plan, like some life coach would say, um, what numbers do I need to achieve for me to get from my C to series A so that I ultimately get my series B and then my exit, right? Yeah. If you, if you then stray from that trajectory, um, you either need to bring the, your end goal down an order of magnitude, or you need to raise more money to get back on track, right? Mm -hmm. But you can kind of plot out like what your future would look like. And so, you know, if you know that you need to get to 1.5 million revenue at your series A, how much money would actually really cost you to achieve that? And so when people are, you know, is thinking about their, how their valuation works, the way valuation really works for companies, how much do you need to raise according to your plan? And then um, how much dilution are you willing to take? Because if you raise a million and you're only willing to take a maximum of 25% dilution, you can kind of guess what your valuation is going to be, right? Yeah, yeah. Whereas if you raise more money and you take the 20, then actually your post money valuation will be higher. But, you know, how much money should you be raising? Um, should you be aggressive or not? It kind of really just comes down to having an actual plan. So, you know, like for financial modeling or business plans or whatever, I actually just teach people to build something that you want to do for yourself regardless and then just show it to investors and be like, this is my actual plan. I need 1.125 million because this is what my actual plan says for me to be able to get to my series A so that I can continue my trajectory to be a hundred million revenue business. Mm -hmm. And you can say it without laughing. You didn't say it's conservative, not just saying like, if I tell you I'm going to do this, this is this is actually what I plan on doing. I'm not saying this for you just to give me money, right? Yeah, yeah. And so when you start thinking of the lens of, uh, I am in this, if you want to build a really big company, it takes time, right? Um, it, I'm in this for seven years. Is this even worth my fucking effort? Should I like be wasting any time on this business or not? And if you go, do you know what? I really believe in this business. This is how big I believe it can be then you figure out how do I make that happen? And so be, you know, be really realistic and be like, how many people should I really hire? You know, what would my acquisition chan uh, cost be and what acquisition channels? You know, how much do I really think my customers are going to be paying for me? Are they going to stay for a while and then head off to Bangladesh or something and not use you anymore? Or, But if you really critically think about it, then you stop thinking about what you think investors want to hear and you start building a business that you believe is going to make you very affluent. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I agree. I mean, I, that's that's the that's the process that we followed. Yeah. Is saying like, you know, what do we actually think um, we need? I guess it's then it's more the matter of then trying to match that up with what we we think that investors 
are going to want to see as well. You know, I mean, I've, some people have said, you know, don't bother putting uh, a, a business plan in front of investors that doesn't show you doing another raise because everyone knows that that's just unrealistic. Yeah, that's the first question I asked you, though, right? Is I do plan living on VC money or not? Yeah. So if you do, then you're in that game. So, but that comes the second, the, the second exercise, which is what is your funding plan over the life cycle of your business in order to get you to your exit? And almost no one's done this because that's an exercise I invented. Um, but if you have that, then it's very, you can actually just show it to someone and be, this is how I've mapped out what we're going to do. And this is why I need this much money. And this is how much money I'm going to raise at the next round mm-hmm. and then at the next round. So if you can do your pro rata or leave the next round, that's fantastic. But we'll be looking for a series B of 20 million, which might be a bit more than you have or something like that. Yeah. Okay. Um, but you know, be, 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 be honest, like most businesses do not get profitable super fast if they're growing. So like if you do a three year financial model and then you have like EBITDA margins of 20% in year three, I'm like, bullshit. Yeah. So then at what point do you think, you know, let's, let's say you're looking at that seven year plan and mapping out all of the raises. Are you saying only even start to look profitable at year seven? I mean, it depends on different types of, it depends on your business model, right? But there's a lot of companies that are not profitable after year seven or let alone year 10, but they're growing at a rate which is acceptable. And so, if, again, like there's not many metrics. The only industry where you really have metrics is SaaS for some weird reason. Uh, it's the only one where people really share stuff. So, um, I mean, you typically have this thing called like a rule of 40 when you're like at a growth stage company, which is that if you're growing at 40%, you can have um, a 0% um, uh, net income loss, right? If you're mm-hmm. growing at 60%, then you can be at negative 20% profit margin. Um, and so, it, you know, if you grow faster, people are more tolerable of you making losses. I see. And so then, and that's what you would sort of set as the, the standard year on year growth. The- well, for an, early stage, for an early stage company, you have the three T double D. So you, you triple, 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 double, double. And if you just get Excel out and you, and you map that off 1 million, you can see how much you get to quite quickly through the power of compounding. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, tip, you know, you can grow at like a thousand percent a year when you've got FL revenue, right? Yeah. But once you get to like a million, if you triple, 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 double, double, you get up to something like 72 million or 80 million or something, um, which is pretty incredible, but that's just the way it works out. Um, so there's a kind of, that's the useful little hacks to kind of think about how fast you should be growing if you're a VC funding company. Mm-hmm. You know, it depends on the industry and kind of how it works out, but that those are relatively safe-ish ways. But again, they're quite aggressive, right? But they're relatively useful little hacks to see are you on track or off track. Sure. I'm talking top line, right? Um, but the more aggressive you are in your growth, then you know the more aggressive you should think in terms of your losses. But, you know, you can have a conversation with investors and be like, you know, I've got two scenarios in my plan. One is we, you know, we grow like the the re- weeds and everything works out well and we raise large amounts of money, um, we'll be growing top line massively. Obviously, our losses will be high because it takes time to recuperate, you know, our acquisition costs or something. And then we've got the more conservative case, which is we raise less money and we focus a little bit more on optimization for profitability. I mean, obviously, I'd like to reinvest in the company if things are working out right, but, you know, we've got two plans for that. Mm-hmm. And do you think there's any... Then you think that's then just leave it up to the investors to decide on which one they, they prefer. I mean, do you think there's do you think there's any, a benefit presenting two or three options to them and saying actually, yeah, which one do you prefer? Um, we're open. Or no, do you think you should I, be sending? You, I think you should be putting forward what you want to build your business because that's what investors want to buy into. Mm-hmm. And if you like, you need to be really like, don't just do stuff because you want money. Do things because that's what you actually want to build. And so you go to investors and like, actually, I really want to build a little big company, but you know, if you don't give me enough money, hey, I'm okay at kind of building a little lifestyle business. I mean, that's such a cop out, right? Yeah, yeah. Then you just got the wrong investor. So there's a lot of, you know, 
you know, the, the, the stupider people like angel investors and stuff, actually the Chinese will ask you that question too, whether or not that's stupid. They've just got a different mindset. You know, when will you be profitable? And, and I'm just thinking in my head, but I just say like, fuck you, how stupid are you? Have you actually ever invested before? Do you know anything about how these companies are built? Mm -hmm. Because it's like the wrong stupid question. You know, it's like, how big can this get? It's a better question. Because if it can get really big, then you can get profitable if you want. Yeah. You know, what, what is also that you want to be investing in, right? If you want to build a nice little dividend paying business, fine, but that's not what I'm building. You should probably shouldn't be investing in tech. You should probably just be buying dividend yielding companies on the London Stock Exchange. Okay. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so that, I think that's just like a mind reset for you as to actually what kind of business you want to get and then finding investors who are aligned with your vision. Yeah, just, just fully just working back from from the exit and then saying, right, what are, what are, the, what are the key things that we need to achieve at each stage to, to get there? And then and aligning the money with that and aligning it with your the plan, I guess. Yeah, what I often find, and I think there's a, inevitably it will will be a bit of um, kind of over optimism, is that when you then start modeling and working out right, actually, what do I fully need? Where where can I where you know basically we're you know we're investing um we'll be investing the raise in optimizing tech to optimize the process. Well, if we think that we can increase efficiency by 50% post next development, then actually we're, less, we're then suddenly looking at a business which can be, be profitable very quickly. So then you, you're starting to kind of, when you're starting to do the, the balances, you're saying, well, that actually this is almost going to be quite difficult for us to, spend so much to, to kind of um, in, in, in growth that we don't necessarily, you know, it, the, the model doesn't seem to show that you necessarily need that. And then because of kind of my mindset of ensuring that we're being efficient as, as much as possible, um, you then start to think, well, actually, maybe, maybe we don't need to be going through so many different rounds of, of funding and actually we can achieve um, you know, a, a really large business um, with, with less. Okay, Gus, if you assume it's going to take twice as long to achieve half as much, your mentality will start shifting on some of your assumptions, right? Mm -hmm. Nothing ever goes to plan. Yeah, there's a reason why you know all investors look at, at financial models and immediately um, divide everything in two, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's, and then, yeah, it and never then, goes to plan. So then that then comes on to my next point, right? Which is even if you're if if I'm realistic about what may happen, and let's say right twice as long, they achieve half as much. Mm. Then you know, is are we yet at a point with investors where you can actually put a realistic plan in place, and they will go, okay, that's actually fine, rather than being overly ambitious because I think that was definitely what I found even with um seed round is that you know you 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 have to show a hockey stick otherwise no one no one's really interested in um what you're saying you know I find myself saying this a lot you're fundamentally investable or not you're fundable or not right and this, the problem is, is that 99% of people are running around for, with unfundable businesses. Mm -hmm. You know, I want to be famous too and be in TechCrunch because it's like a big thing right now, you know? And so your business is either well fundable or not. Because it's quite important to realize is that as soon as you take money from VCs, you're an employee and you can get fired. Mm -hmm. so it's all very well showing them this big plan. But the moment your business starts becoming fundable, we'll all be thinking like, okay, Gus has been like bullshitting us for the past three years. This business is actually starting to take off. Why don't we just fire him and bring in Eric Schmidt, you know? Um, and so you can actually get fired. So you need to start thinking of this as, as like multi-round game theory as opposed to like a one-off. Yeah. And so it's all very well sort of like plodding around you know just to get funded in the short term but really you're trying to build a big business so you need to start thinking about this sort of longer term 
because ultimately like you just want an exit because right now you're not getting paid masses and masses amount of money and you could probably get paid more if you took a job somewhere mm -hmm. so the only way you actually get payback is if you sell yeah so you need to optimize for that exit which is ironically that the longer that you build the company the, the smaller the exit actually is for founders because their dilution, their dilution keeps on kicking in. Mm -hmm. Actually, selling around Series B slash Series C is actually where founders make the most money. But that obviously doesn't work for investors. But you know, that's actually the, the empirical truth. Interesting. Um, yeah. So this is, but you know, fundamental um, difference between what a good exit for a founder is and what a good exit for a VC is. Yeah. Um, yeah, but with your business, I mean, yes, investors want to see that your punchy business, that you have got punchy numbers. But wouldn't it be just be better if, like, you had punchy numbers because you actually believed them and they made sense, not just to get funded? Because think about this now. Completely. Yeah, I mean, I think that's. But I think guess it's the book, the point of that's what I would. I want to show. I wanted to show what I believe we can achieve. And I guess it's an, what I'd be interested to know is what 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 are your kind of three categories then for like. If you, how you would judge if a business is fundable or not. So that, that's the that's the process. As long as you can demonstrate those three things, then. Well, okay, it's not just when I mean, your financial model is sort of like a side note. Like people shouldn't not get funded because of the financial model, right? If people are really interested, they'll find a way of just kind of glossing over something. Mm -hmm. But fundamentally, like, is the market really big? Because the market always wins. So if you have a market size of a million dollars then even if you have 100% market penetration, you only have a million dollar business, right? It's just, yeah. It doesn't work. So it, it, the market has to be big for you to potentially be big. So it can be slightly small now if it's growing really fast and you've got the right timing. But if you don't have a big market, you're just not fundable in the first place or you probably even shouldn't start a company in the first place. Yeah. Um, and then people bet on the team, especially in the earlier stage, because what you're doing is probably not going to be what you're doing in the future. And it's only people who actually care about what they're doing and are capable that will somehow figure out how to make it work. Right? Yeah. So the team is really important. I know it's always said, but no one, no one really internalizes it quite as much as they should and also don't spend as much time recruiting as they should. Um, but it's, you know, for early stage, you know, it's 75% of investors decision is just betting on the team. It's like that much. Mm -hmm. Um, so with traction, it's kind of hard. It's like that quote from that Supreme Court judge or something or whatever it was, who was talking about porn. It was like, I know it when I see it. Um, so there are, depending on your business, you know, CAC LTV ratios and payback times, and you can look at uh, your your gross contribution margin as the basis, you know, revenue less your cogs. Uh, you can see on the multiples of how they're growing year on year. Um, so it's a bit more like ratios than, oh, they're spending this amount of money on R and D. You know, it's um, it's more about, you know, as I said before, order of magnitude in the right direction. You know, how are things trending, um, and getting a sense for how much you've achieved with how much money. So if I gave you a million bucks and you get to like a thousand dollars in revenue, it's not very impressive, right? But if I give you a thousand bucks and you get to a million in revenue, I'm like, wow, it's amazing. Yeah. Um, so how, how much, you know, showing that you're capital efficient is important, so you're not wasting money. Um, uh, yeah, yeah, so traction stuff, you know, depending on what you're doing, like, you know, uh, also, again, it really depends on your business model. So, like, if you don't have a lot of customers, but you've got really low churn and they love you, then it's indicative of you having built a good business, you just don't have enough money for marketing, right? Mm -hmm. So you can make some kind of inferences with these sorts of things to kind of get a feel like, are you undervalued or not? Um, so like when I'm doing financial modeling with people, like CFO kind of help. And when I'm, when I'm reviewing someone's financial model, I basically don't really look at any sheet other than the KPIs because you can see exactly what's going when you look at the KPIs. Mm -hmm. You're like, oh, your LTV CAC ratio is a thousand X in year three. I was like, that clearly doesn't make sense, does it? Oh, yeah, no. And it's like, you know, you start getting EBITDA positive in year three, and it's like, really? 
uh, it's because you forgot to hire enough marketing people or your warehousing people or something. It's like, oh, God, yeah, I forgot about that. I'm like, well, yeah. Um, and so, yeah, yeah, you laugh, but, like, everyone does really stupid stuff. Like, sure. something. Like, there's, everyone has there's something that they've overlooked, which is why you just need to be really diligent and kind of process everything. Um, and then you just figure out, like, what your little skeleton is, uh, a skeleton of ignorance. Um, but yeah, so there's generally like, one, one, another thing I teach people to do, which I find really instructive is if you start pretending like you are the investor and you're pitching the investor, like you, you start actually being able to answer a lot of the questions that you have. And so like, if you know, you had 10 million in the bank, would you put 10 million into this business or not? Um, and what would you want to see for you to then actually allocate that capital to this business? Because yeah. anything, right? But if you really critically start thinking like an investor, then you can actually yeah, help yourself a lot with this stuff. True. Um, just have a multiple personality disorder and it'll be a little bit easier too. <laughs> it's like, Jim, what do you think of this? One second, Gus. <laughs> yeah, I guess the difficult thing is that then inevitably, you, it's, I guess putting that different hat on is, is the biggest challenge, right? Because that's what you're trying to always do is, is be uh, critical um, of it. But you obviously look at, um, you yeah, know, you believe in the business. So you're always going to be uh, putting forward what, what you think, you know, your idea of what is realistic may not necessarily align with uh, an investor's. Well, look, if you're a proper entrepreneur and it's just like building startup is something you just have to do instead of I worked in banking, hated my job, and so startup sounded fun, <laughs> you're always going to build another company, right? Yeah. And so think of it this way, like you have 20 years to make your money. And if this is not working, why are you wasting one of those or one of those seven years building this thing? Yeah. So like at every stage you're at, have a thesis. So if you do that funding exercise where you've got your five rounds of funding or something, you could then write below each stage, what do I need to prove for this to be worth Gus's time to spend another 18 months to get to the next milestone, right? I want to prove I can get X number of revenue, I have X number of customers, my churn rate of this, I still enjoy the company, I can, and then qualitative stuff, I can attract great quality people, I enjoy working at this company or whatever. And then just keep on validating if you're achieving these or not. Because one startup is fungible to another one. You just start another company. True. Is this an ROI on your time or not? And start thinking of this business is just one in the line of many. And there's so many ideas that you could do. Uh, why, not, why not pick the best one? Rather than just this, this has to work because it's my baby. If you could say, fuck it, this, it's not my baby. It's just one of many things I could do. Mm -hmm. And then you start taking, you know, you start becoming so invested in and uh, overlooking what's wrong with it. And don't get me wrong, like you have to have a certain level of ignorance to kind of do startup in the first place. But you also need to be pretty sober about what works and what doesn't because you need to fix it. Yeah. You know? Okay, um, great chatting. I've got another call now. Um, but, um, you know, best luck with it. It's financial models are a pain in the ass, but if you, if you actually put the time into them, you'll get a lot of insight into your business and what you probably haven't thought about. Yeah. Um, but be sober about it and it'll actually help you rather than just being like, Oh, I just need to get it done because investors want it. That's a really bad way of thinking. Like you learn so much by actually going, if I do this, what will happen? You know? Yeah, definitely. No, that's good, good advice. Yeah. All right. Thanks so much, man.